Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Book Lounge. Today, we are talking about The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. Your hosts, as always, are myself, Corinne Ritchie. And me, Tom butler Bowden. Uh, so what we'll do every week is we take a book and we analyze it and discuss it and rate it as well. Um, so hopefully you'll get a sense of the book and work out whether it might be right for you. That's right. And uh, each week I weigh in on the book along with Tom and our guest. We update you on the latest news about the author. And don't forget to check out our book insights episodes. Those are for like the in-depth explorations of these nonfiction books. But here in the book lounge, it's more of just an informal chat about the book of the week. So this week we are bringing on author, entrepreneur, motivational speaker. Uh, he has experiencing and he has, he has experience enhancing systems with multi-million and multi-billion dollar organizations and empowering employees and entrepreneurs to increase their wealth um, and all around perfect person to talk to about entrepreneurship. That's what today is all about, that entrepreneur myth. So please welcome Marcus Garrett. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So glad you're yeah. here. Um, yeah. So Marcus, I read somewhere that you're like a recovering auditor. Uh, so just uh, you can tell people quickly you know, what is your journey to uh, to getting to this point? Well, still am technically a recovering auditor. I've been in the field of audit for, I just say over a decade now. I don't like to do the exact math, um, but it's been, well, I, I thought it was until I was uh, reading the book. I thought it was helpful, but it's been uh, useful for me to set up systems. Um, so I describe that as moving people from goal setting to goal accomplishment. Uh, having done this for, well, I'm going to have to say it now, 15 years, I noticed a lot of companies, organizations, individuals, uh, maybe that's redundant. They they have great goals. They got they got all the marketing and the vision and the strategic plans. And then you're like, uh, you know, they, they write that in December to January first quarter. And then by February, February, like a New Year's resolution, everyone's forgot it. They're, they don't even know where the document it is. I'm like bringing it up. I'm like, I see here in your vision statement. And they're like, we have a vision statement. And so I, I realized that that could also be applied to personal finance and, and life. And so that's kind of what I, I moved forward with, with establishing my own brand and a number of podcasts and businesses over the years. That's great. And in your, um, in your own journey through either through reading or through your own experiences, um, we usually like to start our listeners off with some quick takeaway right off the top of like um, something that you have found useful, a lesson or um, just something that uh, they can put into use, something that's been life changing for you. As far as monetary, it's um, so I read 15 uh, books and I give those reviews away from free to any email subscribers. It's like the 15 best books. I think I got it from like money or something like that. Uh, my favorite now actually changed in 2021. It was uh, The Simple Path to Wealth by J.L. Collins. Uh, prior to that, because it has some sentimental value, my father gave it to me in high school, was The Millionaire Next Door. Mm -hmm. uh, I read that book at 17. Um Apparently didn't learn what I need to as far as takeaways because I was not a millionaire <laughs> uh, presently or yet, but it, it kind of set that foundation. Um, so that's that's always going to have some sentimental value for me. And I read it again in my 30s and it, it, I had more takeaways. And I, I kind of summarize it as, you know, the, the takeaway for me would be um, spend less than you earn or earn more than you spend. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. it's pretty much the, the breakdown and you can overcome a lot. And I think Maybe my my life takeaway, and I think the pandemic has got a lot of us feeling very existential, yes. is um, not to underestimate yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, someone, actually, who's a college student asked yesterday, um, was talking about how do you overcome failure? And um, the answer is by failing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I don't know a way to overcome failure, mm -hmm. but I can say that having failed multiple times and definitely more times than I've actually succeeded, what I have learned is I can get through failure. Um, uh, failure is the price I pay for success and my turnover rate is much quicker uh, mm -hmm. so she was like 22 23 I think I was like you fail it might take you the rest of 2021 to recover from mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you know you need to go through that I, I don't need to discount I don't mean to discount the emotions of that I fail on Monday I'm, I'm good by Wednesday I like my, my emotional turnaround is like two to three days now instead of, you know, I don't need the 12 month turnaround. So um, not to fear failure, but to understand failure is a piece that you have to go through for success. 
Mm, I love that. Yeah, that that sort of uh, reminds me of that quote that says, um, the master has failed more times than the amateur has ever tried. Mm, nice. Like <laughs> yeah, well, the whole psychological aspect to business um, is something we're going to talk about. Because um, I think the E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber came out in 85. Um, it was a bit of an underground hit. Um, but I think it 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 separated itself from the rest of the literature um, by really drilling down into the psychological aspects of being an entrepreneur. Um, a lot of other books were a bit sort of nuts and bolts. So hopefully we can get into that um, a bit. But just um, before we do, just sort of general breakdown. Um, he's got this idea about business as a system um, and, you know, franchising and the whole idea of creating a sort of world of order in your business. Um, but the, the, the sort of the way he gets, uh, gets you reading this book um, is this person called Sarah. <laughs> who's running a pie shop, right? You remember it. Um, and she's been, she started her own business. So she's thrown herself into it. And a few months in, she's like drowning in, in the business. Um, so Marcus, I mean, when someone comes to you at the at small business level, um, how do you sort of approach them? Um, is it, do you, do you come, come there from the sort of psychological level or do you look at the business from the nuts and bolts? Um, what do you do first to help people? Um, with the recovering auditor background, my instinct is to go to, I think he called it a, a technician. Um, that's actually probably where I fall. Um, my father explained it as uh, a good business anyway. I think he was talking about relationships. Everyone has a, a dreamer and an architect. And, you know, in, a, in the perfect world, uh, well, well, he opens with, you know, the architects, actually the, the dreamer's uh, vision is an architect's nightmare because uh, architects got to build it and the dreamer's, you know, fanciful and it tends to be. But if you can find that balance, what he calls a technician, that would kind of be the systems make sense to me. And it's something that I've struggled with as far as, uh, as far as communications, it makes perfect sense to me. Cause I'm like, it's the facts. Like you get out of debt because there's interest and you're spending more money than you need to. You're giving money away to the bank. And they're like, but I really like this car. And I'm like, let me, let me, re I, I don't think you heard me. So the interest and you're giving money away. to, <laughs> And so I, I really like that side. Um, so my takeaway, and this is something I've learned over the years more through on the coaching side is I'm trying to get better about people locking into their why and then building backwards to the facts, uh, the technician side, if you will. I, I kind of feel like I'm actually the exception and the dreamer is the rule. Uh, I think dreamers got you got to think about the type of folks that would even fathom starting a business. <laughs> uh, like, like, why would you, you know, uh, I asked myself that a few times, uh, probably a month, if not a week is, you know, why am I even doing this to myself? This is a choice. Like I'm making the choice to work 60, 80 additional hours and, and as it's set up right now into the business. And so I try to tap into people's why. And I think he does that in the book too, as, as far as the, 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 the pie <laughs> maker is, that's a good starting point that will ground you uh, having that vision will motivate you and continue helping you move forward. Um, then how do you build the pieces around it? And I call it uh, um, hiring where you're weak. Um, so I'm weak at marketing. I'm weak at dreaming. And so I need dreamers surrounding me uh, to kind of break me out of the, the technician side. Mm, yeah, that's a great point. And that's a big theme uh, in, in the e-myth is this idea that uh, I guess the part of the myth is that the entrepreneur can just do it all. That if you have that vision to want to start a business, then you can just do it all by yourself and um, just having the drive is enough. And so uh, the book does a great job of sort of dispelling that myth that just because you have the desire and the drive to start a business does not necessarily mean that you have just where you're talking about, Marcus, both the vision, the dream, and the actual capability of doing all the technical side. And uh, Michael Gerber calls it like, um, 
a technician having an entrepreneurial seizure where, um, you know, they know very technically how to do one specific thing. So in the example the book gives, it's someone who's very passionate about pies and knows how to make really, really good pies. And it's this myth that just knowing how to do something is enough to start a whole business. And the whole point is that there's so much more to it than just what it is you're selling or just what the business is about. Um, it does require, just like you're saying, Marcus, the marketing part of it. It requires um, the vision for the future. It requires all these other things. And so if you've got that one technical piece of it, then you need to find those people and surround yourself with those people uh, who can fill in all of those other gaps that it takes to run any business. Um, so it sounds like you've done a great job of of doing that, Marcus. And how do you help folks when um, they how do you, how do you help folks when they are sort of blinded to those other needs and kind of want to be the super entrepreneur and just do it all themselves, regardless of their skill set? Uh, I think what um, being an audit has helped me with as well is realizing that you know no, no one seeks to be audited, uh, no one likes to be audited. So. Uh, I've, I've been fortunate that I've kind of had a number of uh, mentors and I've had a great network over the years. Um, but one of them said, no matter what field you're in, you're always in marketing. This was before I ever started a business. I thought he was crazy at the time. I still talk to this, this individual or friends, friends now on Facebook. So it's official. Uh, but he was my mentor at that time. Um, but I think what he meant by that is it's less important about why I'm there. Um, it's more important for them to understand what they're trying to accomplish. Because I think you can build backwards from that. I, I think I don't want to undervalue or undercut the emotional vision and, and importance that is necessary to start a business. Because that is actually what will keep people going, you know, because I'm an auditor, I jumped at some of the numbers, he's like 40% fail in the first year, 80% after five years, and then another 20% fail after that which I think gets us to 100% if I'm doing the math correctly. But that being said, <laughs> clearly, uh, you know, somebody is out there succeeding. Mm -hmm. uh, but those are intimidating numbers. Um, and so to differentiate yourself, you have to do differently. Um, it sounds intuitive, but a lot of people are like, you know, like in the business, like I'm passionate about making pies. Uh, me, I'm passionate about writing books. I'm passionate about looking at the data and doing the research. Um, but with rare exception, a lot of people aren't going to come to me for my, uh, not for what I'm trying to do now for my auditing skills, <laughs> uh, for, for my ability to do research and analysis. So what is driving us forward and what's going to keep us motivated? And what I kind of try to describe it as is, you know, being demonstration through um, being a leader through demonstration. So being humble in my own ignorance. So uh, I can kind of now share my story. Like I failed here for these reasons because I was arrogant. Uh, that's not what people call it, but they're like, I'm a great pie maker. So I should be uh, putting the pie making game on its ear. Uh, the example I use is these folks still have their, their, their claws out there, but uh, I think it's Cutco or Velcro, what, whatever it is, they sell knives. They, they talk you into this MLM mm -hmm. <laughs> of selling knives. And, I, and, I, and it's actually amazing how many people I call it falling victim. I'm probably going to be sued by this company eventually. <laughs> I always, my saving grace is the only customer I ever had was my parents and they still have these knives. Great knives, great, probably <laughs> the greatest knives on, on the history of earth. These knives cut through ropes, pennies, you know, I still got the salesman in me. But, <laughs> so you're also a recovering uh, Cutco <laughs> salesman, I see. Good to exactly. know, good to know. Uh, I'm recovering, uh, what you call it, vacuum, the, uh, the, Kirby the Kirby vacuum. I accidentally <laughs> got sucked into selling Kirby's. So, actually, I think we're proving a great point. A great marketing plan, that passion, you know, like I thought I was going to put the, the, you thought the vacuum game, I was going to like, I was going to, I now just saying it out loud, and I've told this story a hundred times, like the idea that I was going to put the knife game on his ear, like I was going to take over the knife, you know, Ramsey was going to be asking me for advice on the knife, like, I don't know, Ramsey, I don't know, <laughs> you need to look at these cut codes because, you know, you could be slicing ropes and steaks right now. <laughs> um, so you can't really underestimate that passion but I think to your point earlier into the book's overall theme is you you need to round yourself out and you can round yourself out with strong hires and usually as he points out not to hire yourself so I try to make a concerted effort for myself and others like I'll say this and my my boss is really good at it when I when he hired me something I didn't really actually I don't think I ever heard in his interview 
He's like, what do you need from me as a boss? Mm -hmm. And I said, having lots of painful lessons learned and failures over the years, I said, I want somebody that will make me the best me, not another them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of bosses just try to mold you into the second version of them. Right. Um, I think both through bosses and entrepreneurship, you want to surround yourself with the weakest version of you. And that will actually make you the strongest version of you. Yeah, this is something he here Gerber talks about. Um, so if Sarah's got this point in her business, she's overwhelmed. So she thinks, okay, I'm going to hire some more people. But then a month later, that person leaves <laughs> that she's put invested a lot in. And then she hires someone else and that person leaves a few months down the track that she spent a lot of time training. So um, she gets this realization that it's not just about hiring great people. They're often the answer, but they're never the complete answer. It's really about creating a system that will work. Whether or not you've got great people or mediocre people um, that you have set up all these processes so that you know everything is going to work. The product or service is, is going to get out there. The customer is going to be happy, just because everything is written down. You have a process. Um, and he calls it like a turnkey thing. And McDonald's is his. Um, he he has up there his sort of perfect turnkey uh, thing. And I guess I mean that sort of seems to take away a bit of the romance of setting up your own business. But um, Marcus, I would have thought if you are able to create something like that, some system, that would give you an incredible buzz because it would mean that it could be replicated, you know, many, many times. Well, I, I agree with the principles of the book. Um, one thing that, and this is, like I said, something I'm working on in real time is also digging into what motivates the individual. Um, so for example, that's really exciting. I, I wrote it down. I, I, I have a little notepad that I have every time because I'm an auditor and it has a usually blue, red, black pen. I got a blue, red pen today. And the quote that I put was discipline provides freedom. I was like, yeah, I was excited when I read this, you know? <laughs> yes, I knew it. I, you know, anything that validates that I was right, I'm excited about. Um, but I, that doesn't motivate some individuals. But to that individual, I would say you, for your business to succeed, what you are passionate and excited about, you need an individual who is motivated by systems thinking. You do need that person that will write the policies and procedures and make it a turnkey. Um, I'm sure McDonald's has the same way, but an uh, example I would have, I, I used to live in this small college town. I actually think the town is still small. They probably think they're big because uh, they got a Walmart now. And I, I think, a, <laughs> what is the maker of the, the Buffalo Wild Wings? I think they have a Buffalo Wild Wings now. So they're, you know, they're on the forefront. Yeah, exactly. They just need tra Trader Joe's and they'll, they'll be real. <laughs> and um, I remember it must have been two weeks. Like, you know, you drive the same route every single time. And I remember there was a Jack in the Box. And even the the floor plan was fabricated. Like they brought four walls and stood it up one day. Like I drove by like at 8 a.m. There was nothing there but a pallet. And then I came by and there was a jack in the box there. And I'm like to have someone that someone, a system thinker, you know, the entrepreneur, Jack, whoever is under that big head, he probably does not care how those four walls came up, but somebody probably came up with a formula one day, like likely an engineer or technician. It was like, we could save X amount millions of dollars and make Jack in the Box franchises. So I'll say McDonald's to stick with the book all across the country. If we just came up with a way to fabricate these walls. So you need those individuals on your team so that your business can grow. And in this case, um, and, and that's one thing I think uh, should be clear is he was building businesses for franchising. Um, some people they're like they would be happy and content. And I think that's fine if they know that, that that's their vision. Like I, I just want my pie business on the corner uh, to be successful and my friends and family to know me. Um, I have this vision that one day I I've told my fiance about it, that I'll, I'll open a bar and just everyone will know me. I'll be old and retired. And I'll be like, Marcus, you know, I'm like, hey guys, you know, I'll probably be like barely making ends meet, but I've been dreaming about this for years. <laughs> this, this, this struggling failed bar business that's going to exist somewhere. Um, but like, you can't underestimate having that, 
passion for it. As long as you, I think if you're not it, that you surround yourself with those people that allow you to be successful. Yeah. And I think Ray Kroc from McDonald's definitely had those people. I can't remember. There were three or four, um, but you know, Ray Kroc was, he was easily inspired by stuff. Like he had this sort of religious moment when he first had his first French fries at the original McDonald's. Right. And he thought, wow, this and this fantastic system, you know, I could see this working anywhere. So he had a bit of both. He was very inspired by stuff, but he had this team around him that thought in terms of real estate, like McDonald's became a huge real estate owner and created the whole franchise and everything. So I, I'd imagine every great company has this blend of the original inspired creative founder and the system thinkers underneath them for sure. Yeah, I really like um, the book talks about the life cycle of uh, a business and about franchising. So just like that McDonald's example, um, he talks about how all businesses begin at infancy. So for the McDonald's example, it's when the brothers, the McDonald brothers just had their single location and they were doing really well with their single location. They knew exactly their own system, but they didn't know. Uh, how great that system was that it could be replicated. They only had the vision of the single location and it took the Ray Kroc to come in and say, you've got this down to a science. So that means you can do this anywhere. Um, so it, the, the infancy is when basically the owner and the business are inseparable. If the two McDonald brothers weren't physically in the building or if they weren't actually you know, doing everything, then the business would die. And so that's infancy. Um, and then uh, the book talks about how moving from infancy to adolescence is where you first start hiring staff and when you're bringing other people in and when um, it's sort of the, the owners and the business can work side by side, um, maybe necessary, maybe not. But maturity is when the vision, the goals, the achievements of the business happen with or without the owner, the founder, the, the person. That's when the business is really mature, when um, it's replicable because it's down so, it's so systematized and it's separable from the owner because it's that much of a working machine. Um, so how, how does that sit with you? How do you resonate with that, Marcus? Um, I'm not going to lie. It was, it was painful. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and the reason was, is uh, so depending on how you do the math, this would be my second or third business. The third is running under my own brand. Um, I, I've, I've been in adolescence a lot. <laughs> And so seeing it prescribed like that, and he's right, where you're you're inseparable for the business. Um, I think uh, I think it's Garner, Lori Garner from uh, Shark Tank. She says only an entrepreneur would wait eight, work eighty hours to avoid working forty hours, <laughs> and you know you you can't escape it uh, from for two points. One, you're either not making enough money to hire, or number two, you think you have to do all the things either because you're the best at it or you're if you don't do it it won't have your touch on it or, or things like that um those are like the um the failures if you will i guess that was in the, the 20 to 80 percent math as far as the failed businesses i had and what i'm trying to do now i guess a call to action or takeaway that i'd have for individuals is um I have two you know, business coaches. One might say I have one and a half because like we, I can't afford him. So he like, he gives me guidance and then he's like, come back to me when you can afford me. He sent me his price rate one day. I was like, uh, can I just ask a couple follow up questions? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so he talks to me when he has time. But that being said, I, I count him as two because I'm being optimistic, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, um, that dreamer. Yeah. And I remember one time, which told me, tells you how unready I was for the conversation. He's retired. He's worked in $10 million, $350 million organization, has scaled them accordingly. Mm -hmm. And he was like, well, where do you see yourself in five years? Um, actually, I think he said 10 years. And I think I was trying to get through like Friday that, that week. <laughs> right. And I was like, I, I don't have any idea. And he's like, well, let me show you where I see you. And he started like, you know, he's like a, a magician. And I was like, oh, well, he's moving pieces around. He's like, and I see this and, this, and, and millions and a hundred souls. And I was like, you know, God, I got to pay this guy. <laughs> um, and, and that's what I'm talking about is, again, being humble where I'm. I don't have, because I've stuck in adolescence, I don't have the vision to know what, oh, excuse me, infancy. Oh, man, it's even more offensive. So I've been so <laughs> stuck in a infancy, 
I don't know what it's like to carry a business to adolescence. I think this one is the closest I've gotten to adolescence. And we are setting up the systems, as the book says, and as my business coach says, in the beginning for success at maturity, because I do want this to be something that we could scale and possibly grow and in either franchise or sell to another um, company to take over. And to have that forethought coming in, what does work for me as soon as he said that, he's like, I can work backwards really good. That's the auditor in me. So he's like, here's what 10 years looks like. So I'm like, okay, that's, you know, 31, 2031. What does 2021 look like? And I could start putting those steps, processes, and pieces together to get there. Um, so sometimes, as I, I guess I'll continue to echo, you need someone to tell you what there looks like. And you need to be receptive to that advice, uh, whether that's going to be this book or an individual that you can surround yourself with. Uh, and then to follow that roadmap, um, you definitely don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think a lot of entrepreneurs think they do. I put the knife pie and Kirby vacuum game on its ear, but clearly it's been done. Uh, done because uh, The reason I knew that Kirby is because my mom owned a Kirby. <laughs> I sold knives. So clearly they will be around and stick around. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> Yeah, so it's all about, as he says, working on your business instead of in it. Um, but, I mean, as you mentioned before, if you don't have enough money to hire another person or hire a business coach, um, you can sort of be in a bit of a chicken and egg situation, I guess. Um, so I think many people must be stuck in that, actually. Um, I mean... When I was like in college and stuff, worked in a lot of small businesses, um, people running shops and things, and they they didn't really get beyond the family uh, running phase. Um, they did pretty well out of it, uh, but even hiring one or two extra people was like a, a sort of leap of faith. Yeah, and you felt like you were, you know, not really part of this clan. Um, so I think, yeah, all, all what you're saying resonates. It's just sort of getting to the next stage. It's very psychological. And I think where this, this is where this book is so good. Um, he, Gerber really gets um, almost sort of mystical. I mean, he, he, he's got a few authors he, he mentions he's influenced by quite sort of spiritual uh, people like, Zen, people like Robert Persig and Carlos Castaneda. And um, you think you're reading a business book. And then he comes out with stuff like this. Um, and it's good, though, because it makes the, the individual really think about what they're doing. You know, do you think, guys, I mean, is there a particular type of person who can start a business and cope with it? And is there like an employee wage earning mindset that are very different or you know how much sort of how much uh blurred lines is there between them yes uh i definitely think and i, I have to uh break out of it because i've got uh, a foot in both worlds right now and probably why i was not successful before and I, i'm talking about employee versus entrepreneur uh, i think the simplest is as an employee um, I'll give today as an example, like, uh, my boss had literally said, you know, these are your two priorities for the week. Um, I think there's, he said for the day, uh, we kind of go back and forth. Uh, I think we're joking. I think he's serious. Uh, I'm like, you know, uh, you know, if everything's a priority, then nothing's a priority. He mm -hmm. stares at me blankly. He's like, get them both done. Mm -hmm. Um, and see what I say that is that's very clear. Like, he told me this is, you know, uh, I break him down his most important task. And I got that from something else I read. Um, so every week, um, you could say month and or year by extension, I've got, you know, what I'm using now is Microsoft Planner. And it's, it's, you know, it looks like a Christmas tree, you know, it's got all these different colors in it and, you know, high priority, low priority, and, you know, no less than 25 projects, if not 100. And the list only grows. The list has never shrunk since I've started this job. And it never does in any job that I'm in. Um, so functionally, what that means is I sit down with my boss, who is one of the better bosses that I've had. And he tells me, this is your priority for the week. Do this and you will make me your boss person who signs your check happy and successful. You will have a job next week. <laughs> um, that's employee. That's like going to school, as you mentioned. Going to college is 
you're told what to do. Complete this syllabus. You will graduate. Do these things. That's that kind of system thinking that, that aligns with me for an auditor. So in some ways, not to discount it, employee is inherently easier if for no other reason someone's telling you what to do. And then, you know, I log off 501 and I, you know, log into my business accounts and I start catching up there and there's no one to tell me what to do. My, I, even my business coaches only meet with me once a month. So unless I want to do nothing for three weeks out of the, out of the month, I've got to figure it out. You know, I've got to figure out, you know, how do I scale this business? Let me look over here at my, uh, I have a vision board over here <laughs> behind. So I have it broken down by quarterly. Uh, for example, so I had to set up and this is done like my community letter news subscription, for example. Um, I, I had convert kit I had started out with there was MailChimp and now I'm with Active Campaign, great brand and I, I wish they were an affiliate because they're awesome and I'd plug them. Uh, <laughs> but I'm now with Active Campaign. But there was no one to tell me which was the best software. So I had to try all three, I had to fail with a few. Uh, and then I'm also tech, I'm not I'm a technician, but I'm like, technically challenged. So I have to like watch YouTube videos and figure because there's no one, there's no one, I'm a solopreneur. So there's no one I can tell, Hey, figure out active campaign. Um, and really I got there from the recommendation of another successful entrepreneur. And I was talking to her. Um, we had a mastermind and I was like, Hey, you know, there's this new tech I'm trying to, to figure out, you know, what would you do? This, this woman makes multi-millions. <laughs> and she was like, I tell my tech person to figure it out. And I was like, <laughs> all right, well, I'll go back to watching YouTube videos. And I don't know that there's, you know, not to be cliche, I think anyone can succeed. Uh, but my quote is, this is more so for the trolls, because I've noticed as my brand has grown, the trolls have come, which is no one was listening to me at 100 followers. But now suddenly the trolls are showing up now that I'm more successful. Always a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> they don't they don't right. realize that's validation. I'm like, yes, yeah. they're hating on me. That means <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the brand, the brand is successful. <laughs> um, but, you know, my simple quote is, if you could, you would. And mm. if you can, you should. Mm. It's really easy to be, you know, behind the rope talking about what's going on in the club, you know. Mm -hmm. But that being said, um, so I think anyone can succeed, um, but it is two different mindsets, and it can be frustration, frustrating. And as he mentioned in the book, which was one of the painful takeaways, we used to do this. Um, so we ran one company; we were in our twenties. Is when it gets difficult, you want to stay in the adolescent phase, because. Mm -hmm. And he said, you'll regress. So you, you were, Tom, you were talking about hiring that moves you to, uh, actually, I keep saying adolescence because it's nicer, is the infancy phase. <laughs> <laughs> so you get stuck in infancy because think about it, infancy, you know, you, you go to sleep, you wake up at home in bed, you know, someone, you just, you don't even know how to happen. You just wake up comfortable, built, bottle fed. And it's a, it's a very comfortable place. And literally what I wrote down is if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you've got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, there will inevitably be something today, if not this week, that will go wrong in my business that will make me uncomfortable. And if I want it to be in one of the 10%, not in the 40 and 80% that fail, I got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and I've got to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a, an amount of risk that you have to be willing to take in order to move through those phases, because moving from infancy to adolescence, as Gerber describes, it, it is a big risk to, to hire people and to know that their livelihood relies on you in some kind of way. Um, it's, it, it is a risk that, it, you know, as a solopreneur, if you fail, you fail. But then when you move from that infancy into that adolescence, if you fail, multiple people fail, multiple people uh, are, are relying on you in, in a very public way. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I totally empathize and understand that, you know, that that uncomfortable that you're talking about has to do with um, a lot of different things, but one of them is the, the risk of failure and um, failing privately alone, just yourself is a lot easier than failing others who, um, you know, have depended on you for their income, their stability, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the well, the Uber entrepreneur of the day, Elon Musk, said, mm. "Starting a business is like chewing glass and staring into the abyss." <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he should know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you have to be tough. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it, uh, I think the 
I think everything is a risk. Uh, I, I, it's, it's interesting because all of us really, um, you're, you're taught school inherently t- teaches you not to take risk. You know, yep. it, it encourages yep. you to uh, follow a plan and, and go and get a job. Um, you know, and that's what 90% of people will do. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, with the exception of uh, the millionaire next door points out that I think, um, I think it's 80%, but undoubtedly entrepreneurs are overrepresented in uh, millionaires. Um, so there's, there's reward in the risk. But what I was going to say is every decision is a risk. Uh, and I deal with this a lot because most of my um, advice to date has been in personal finance. So it's literally personal and it's literally money. So there's emotional all all around. And people are like, well, I don't want to invest in this. And I I don't want to, that's a risk. That's a risk. That's a risk. But, you know, I'm like, you know, not investing is a choice, but also is a risk too. You're going to lose 10% every year. You you buried under a mattress, you're going to lose 10% to uh, inflation every year. Um, So even if you put in a, well, what used to be a few years ago, a high yield account, a high yield is a misnomer these days because I think they pay like 1%, but I was like, at least beat inflation so that if you put a thousand dollars on your mattress, you'll have a thousand dollars later because it would have netted between inflation and your uh, high yield account. Now you'd actually still be losing a percentage a year. So people think they're being they're avoiding risk or uh, have a risk strategy because they're like, I won't do anything risky ever. I'll be good. Um, and I, I say two takeaways from that monetarily, that is blatantly false. <laughs> uh, so that goes back to the data, you know, so I have to check back into the emotion of that, but I can prove that to be wrong. I can do the math to prove that wrong. Uh, so on the show, I say, use facts to form opinions instead of opinions to form facts. That's like one of our takeaways. Uh, so a lot of people like to use opinions to form facts. And I'm like, eh, that, that is wrong. Like we, you know, I can prove that wrong. Uh, but the other side of it is if you can get comfortable with being uncomfortable or, or realizing the calculated risk, then you can kind of paint both sides. And so I'll, I can just tell, you know, this scenario, choice A, um, that you're making right now, these are the results of it. And we walk through that, you know, whatever that looked like. And there's here's how the story ends. So let's say that your thousand dollars is worth five hundred dollars you know, 20 years from now, uh, because in a lifetime, you'll lose about 75% of your value in in your money if if you don't earn any interest on it, just just to inflation on average. If you're okay with that, if you're okay saving money and making less later, cool. Like, it was a great conversation. You know, probably we can do that in a consultation. 15 minutes, great talking to you. Yeah, hope you have a good day. But if your goal, which a lot of people is, uh, is to either make money or be successful or be richer than they are today, tomorrow, your choice does not align with your goal. So now Marcus isn't telling you you're wrong and the facts don't align with what he's saying. You're telling me that your choices to not take a calculated risk is not allowing you to hit your goal. You know, let them process that. Yeah, you know, first of all, they don't have emotional reaction. Marcus, how dare you? It's, it's always my fault. This is where the trolls show up. How dare you, you know, drop this consumer business report? <laughs> Right. I, I didn't even write this report. It's actually a screech. That being yeah. said, you know, let them get through that. And I was like, now let's talk about choices B. Um, so I was fortunate. My dad has a background in sociology. Uh, so I've been lectured all my life is what I tell people. I'm qualified to lecture just because I've been lectured all my life. You know, dad's college <laughs> professor. I've been hearing lectures all my life. I'm a subject matter expert. I've heard 10,000 hours worth of lectures. So I'm an expert. <laughs> uh, if, but one thing he used to he used to always say to me, uh, and I never really understood it when I was young. Oh, when I came home with the knives, <laughs> as a perfect example, I'm like, Dad, ching, 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 you know, I'm cutting up with rope and, you know, cutting through the penny. And uh, he's like, you know, look at this new age steel. And he just would always say, what's plan B? And as I got older, I noticed he asked that. So he, my dad was at that time, must have been in his 40s or 50s. I've been very humbled by this now, realizing that my parents are my age raising me. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> uh, that being said is you know most people don't have a plan b they barely have a plan a and so to just to even ask them like what's plan b is like a mind-blowing experience it's like when my business coach said what's the 10-year plan i was like i don't have a five-day plan to be perfectly honest with you um and and that is something you can bring to the table for yourself and others and then inherent in that here's where it gets really scary as you know, there's 24 other letters in the alphabet. <laughs> so it's plan C and D and E and F and all down the line. And that's when you start to get in that turnkey and that business planning. Mm, yeah. You know, that reminds me a lot of uh, when we did a book insight on the um, 
Robert Kiyosaki book, The Cash Flow Quadrant. Mm, and yep. he talks a lot about that, of how people feel like they don't want to invest because of that risk factor. But he says, even if you just have a job and you just have one, you know, you're just an employee, that means you have one stream of income. And that is a huge risk because as we've just seen during the pandemic, if your whole industry goes under suddenly, unexpectedly, as we have seen, or if your business uh, fails for some reason, or if your, uh, you know, boss turns out to be one of the Enron guys or something, you know, there's no way to predict that your one stream of income is going to sustain you in perpetuity. Chances are it's not going to. So if you think you're avoiding risk by just having a job and like you said, saving money in a bank account and just hoping for the best, um, you are, you are taking risk. You're just taking different risks than, you know, than what actually works, as you've said, with the numbers that do not lie. Hmm. Yeah. I think during the pandemic, side hustles have increased like 100%. Because yeah. people have suddenly realized this. Um, probably e even the people who've still got their job, but are wondering what the hell yeah. <laughs> is this business still going to exist in six months' time? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, yeah, makes sense. Um, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, uh, uh, like everyone, I, mean, I don't think I'm a unique experience, but I, I had two kind of wake up calls. Um, both in age and pandemic. So um, I'm a senior millennial, latter leaning millennial, uh, not quite Gen X, not quite Xennial. I want to be very specific about the <laughs> that we're talking about. <laughs> uh, but I, I say that because, you know, going through that in your late 30s, uh, it's a different takeaway. Um, and like the pandemic was a different wake up call. And like you, you mentioned earlier, Tom, is almost existential because it's like, you know, when you're, when you're locked in the house, I was literally locked in the house, like everybody else in the rest of the country. When I was locked in the house, you kind of, you know, watching the sun move across the roof. It's like, hey, what am I doing here? <laughs> is, is this really where I want to spend my life and my time? It, it was actually, I had already started the business, but it really solidified more things that I want to do with my life and legacy and purpose and um, how I want to spend and allocate my time. But even if the pandemic hadn't ever occurred, like one of our first episodes, we used to have a personal finance podcast is uh, we trying to remember a tagline. We help millennials make money, save money and get out of debt. Talking to interview experts uh, every every week for four years. And our first episode, <laughs> I don't even know why people came back. Our first episode was the paycheck plateau. We had like we, we you know, I, I'm the audit side. So I like to grab interesting stories and facts. They tend to be dark. I'm an auditor. Uh, they're fascinating to me. And we kind of read through the analysis and they found that on average, the paycheck uh, stagnates. I believe for men, it was 48. And I want to say it was around 90,000. And for women, it was 38 um, for a number of issues that we have in the United States. And if not broad, as far as pay gap goes. And, you know, think about that, that functionally, because we get lured into this place of comfort. I think you can in a business. I think you can as an employee. Um, 40% of your, on average, and these are all averages, but a 40% of your income comes between 25 and 35. I, I literally had a 40% jump in my salary at like age 27. And so you're like, this will be forever. I mean, like every time I negotiate my salary, I've never had another 40% jump in my salary to, get, to tell you how this story ends, to foreshadow. <laughs> uh, and I probably never will. I, I couldn't even fathom a job that would increase my income right now 40% in the field that I do right now. But what a lot of people do, because they're on plan A path, is they get to 40, 48 or 38, regardless of what it is. And y'all can Google this information to validate it to make sure I'm not making it all up. And then you're like, oh, my, my pay is, first of all, you wouldn't, might not even know to call it stagnation. You might just be like, I'm not making more money. I'm actually making less money between taxes and, and health savings and you know the, the healthcare costs have gone up and my, you know, my, my family has grown and gotten better. So you're like, I'm making less. I, my, my salary says, a bigger number than it did 10 years ago. And I'm bringing home less money. It's a very confusing paradox. And if you, one avenue, one plan B. For me, no matter what happens, whether this business succeeds or fails, a lot of it's automated. Um, yeah, I got, I have seven actually, but I got seven other streams doing something to work for me. So when inevitably, and I know for a fact that it will, <laughs> that is the, that is the downside of being an auditor. I know for a fact, my salary will stagnate at some point. If it has not already, I might be in denial. Um, 
at least I've got six or seven other things already working for me. And then inherent in that is I didn't start with seven. I, I started with one. I, I think the book was first. Um, and then the book led to courses and then the course, like they lead to other things. Um, and, and Tom, to your point, you use Elon Musk. I try to find, like you said, you need something that resonates with people, like a meme, you know, the meme God. And so I'm like, you know, I'm building something similar to a Jeff Bezos model, just not as successful. I don't think I'll ever be a billionaire. I, I'll take it if it comes. <laughs> uh, with that being said, I can guarantee you for a fact, Jeff has no idea. He's retired now, actually, but he had no idea what was going on in Amazon at, at a certain point. No idea. I guarantee you, Jeff did not know that you bought, like, what did I buy recently? I bought this little camera stand that actually I could be using here that spins. Him. You think Jeff knows <laughs> that Marcus Garrett bought a $29.99 camera stand? Like, he doesn't care, but he will gladly take whatever percentage point that adds to his billion dollar empire. And, and that's what I'm talking about is the, I keep saying infancy stage, the step is the first step. So now a lot of people, cause you know, senior millennials, they come and they're like, oh, how, how did you do it? You know, the, the weird benefit is when you get older, people think you're smart. You just failed so many times that you know what doesn't work. <laughs> Sounds like intelligence. <laughs> and so I'm like, the first step is the first step. Like there, there, there is no magic step. I know a lot of shortcuts now, but the first step, whatever it's gonna be, is the first step. And then you can kind of, it, it, people hear that and it sounds so you know crazy, but it's like, I know I'm going to fail. I know something this week will break. I know for a fact, because it, it does every week. I don't know what the thing is, but something on my, like my website form moved the other day and people couldn't sign up for no reason. I didn't even log in or touch the website. The Russians got in and did something to it. I don't know what happened, <laughs> but like my site just was not working. Like, and then you know, you just got to log in and, and figure it out. Um, but these are all calculated risks. And I think the simplest calculated risk that you can take is while you have that job, working to whatever your point of inevitable stagnation will be, what can you be doing to increase your salary? Uh, well, that's the example that, that I use uh, because I'm in the personal finance world. But whatever motivates you, has made you passion or has gotten you clarity to tie it all back during the pandemic, um, are you moving towards that goal? And then mm -hmm. if not, that's fine. Um, what choices can you make today uh, that can move you towards that? I posted this yesterday. Um, you're never, you're never too old to start, but you're, uh, yeah, you're never too old to start, but you're always young enough to, to start, you know, like it first step is the first step. Yeah. And we should also say that that first $10 or a hundred dollars that you get, from some stream of income that's not your job. It's incredibly exciting. Uh, I can remember some first message I got from an agent about a book deal, my first book, and it was much more exciting than any wage slip I'd ever got. <laughs> uh, so bear that in mind. Um, that's right. Guys, we should uh, move on to give our rating on the book out of five um, and why. Corinne, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. So um, out of five, I give this book four out of five bookmarks. Um, I, I love it. I think it's a wake up call to the current culture that says like anyone can do anything, anytime. Like, I think part of that is true and there are bits of it that are good. Um, but I like that this book is not uh, the rah, rah, anyone can do anything. Just put your mind to it. And, you know, it, it, I think it's a lot more nuts and bolts, which I, I enjoy. I like the stats. I like the, um, the systematization and just, you know, really keeping a grounded uh, perspective on what has worked in the past, what's working now, and what is projected to work in the future. I really like that. Um, so it's tough medicine, but it's enjoyable. Um, I say four out of five only because I think a revised version that addresses um, more of the like personality influencer based businesses so that we're seeing so much of that now of like the coaching and um, just the, you know, like you mentioned, the solopreneurs, like that's a big thing right now. And so uh, that personality driven, you know, thing Thing, there's something to that. And I do think that this book miss, misses the mark on that. So that's the only reason that I, I give it a uh, four out of five. Yeah. What do you, what do you think, Marcus? Yeah, I'm going to echo that for the same reasons. I'll give it four out of five as well. Um, 
like I said, I, I'm I'm very comfortable in the darkness. I exist in the darkness, sort of like Batman. It's just like, you know, I was molded by the dark. <laughs> and, uh, and so it, I like the facts, the figures, um, and I like the idea, this is going to sound weird, but knowing that others have failed, knowing that 80% failed, that actually gives me a place of comfort. Like going in, knowing that, hey, only one in five people succeed at this. So if <laughs> I'm actually in better company failing with the four and five, <laughs> right. then I am succeeding with the one in five. That helps me. I'm like, oh, this is probably going to fail and suck. So let me just go ahead and start it up anyway, because it, it's statistically likely to fail. Mm -hmm. And thus, uh, to Tom, Tom, uh, he made a great point. I didn't even realize this. So um, despite all of this, I'm actually like an emotional hoarder. I'm a complicated individual. Um, <laughs> but I have my emails turned on for so I, when I get alerts, when someone buys a course, I get an alert when someone buys an affiliate. I don't have to. I mean, like I could. But I like hearing that ding. I rush over to my phone. It's like you have made. I'm like, like. And uh, what I tell people is, you know, tying it back to the book. One thing that I, you cannot, it is invaluable, even to this day, and I've been doing it, my dad asked me yesterday, somewhere between five or 10 years, how to do the math. I've been in this per personal finance realm. The idea that I can just sit down and like, I, I come up with a concept. Now I've got about seven contractors uh, that I, I work with. And we've been working together so long, like uh, he calls it a wireframe, a graphic designer. I'd be like, hey, I've, I've got this idea. And before I even like get too detailed, he knows, you know, he's been in my head long enough. So he's like, I, I, I got it, man. I'll put something together. Tell me which one. I was like, I want the, the graphic here and I want it to fly out. Now, you know, I always go overboard. And he's like, yeah, I can't do any of that, but I'll, I'll get you a model. And then I go to my graphic designer. I was like, hey, the graphic site designer is designing this, you know, and they, we all start working and to go from idea to concept to that email where we get paid, I, I wish, I want everyone to have that. And if this book or any book can move them towards it, like, and it sounds crazy until you, like Tom said, to you see it, uh, um, it it's, I, I won't be cliche, but it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing feeling. It's am every time I get an email, I'm excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I give it four and a half. Um, I think in the whole, personal finance business canon it's really up there such a classic now I mean people still getting a lot out of it I see it you know that book the hard thing about hard thing about hard things <laughs> um which is like a CEO level how to run a big big company like the white knuckle ride this is more like the small business version of that and I think this book has saved a lot of people from blindly going into opening a business when they didn't know anything about how it was actually going to be. So I, I think it's been very, very powerful book and it's just a great read. I mean, Gerber writes well, it's even funny in bits. So yeah, very good. Yep, yep, engaging uh, for sure. Yeah, Corinne, I think we're coming up to our hour so we should probably wrap up. All right. Yep. So uh, news. So today, uh, Michael Gerber has authored dozens of books, including numerous versions of the E-Myth. So um, a lot of these versions are specialty. So about particular industries or occupations, just like uh, E-Myth for optometrists, E-Myth for real estate agents, HVAC contractors, like he's uh, <laughs> nailed this down to very specific Franchise. industries. Yep. Yep. He's franchised it. He, he figured out a book that people liked and worked and then he franchised the heck out of it. So uh, yeah, leading by example. <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly. Um, today, Gerber is regularly quoted and interviewed by Forbes, Business Insider and many other news outlets as the expert on small business development. Um, he also has a new business training company um, called Radical U, which is like online courses and classes for entrepreneurs. So that's that's the latest on him. All right. So this is the part where we get to ask Marcus uh, how we connect with you. So how do our listeners or viewers on YouTube um, connect with you or any upcoming projects you've got or what's what's new and exciting in your world that you want to let everybody know about? Uh, try to make it easiest for the people on the platform. So if you're on YouTube, just go over to the search bar and search the Marcus Garrett. I have a YouTube channel as well, uh, but I'm universally branded. I have a podcast that I'll be bringing out. I'm at themarcusgarrett.com. If you visit there, themarcusgarrett.com, it'll uh, give you a button slash webinar. Uh, you can also sign up for our free webinars and free replays, and I'll send you a free replay for how much debt you can afford on a 30, 50 or $100,000 salary. It's one of our most popular. So of course it's hidden and available at themarcusgarrett.com slash webinar. <laughs> that's great 
and, I'm, and we'll be sure to include those links in the show notes so they're not hidden and we can uh, <laughs> make sure folks can easily find those great resources. So, um, and as always, uh, if you want to connect with us, Book Insights, uh, our handle is at Book Insights Pod on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, and then you can also watch all these interviews on YouTube as well, Book Insights Podcast. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, Marcus. It's been great having you. Really appreciate you sharing your insights with us um, on as we discussed the e-myth. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Marcus. All right. Thanks, everyone, for watching, and hope you'll tune in next week for a new Book of the Week. Mm-hmm.